May I apologise for the delay? This was due to a power failure caused by the weather. We're going to have to commence the meeting where the public left it last time, so I'm going to have to ask Councillor Anderson to start again. Are you there, Councillor Anderson? Yes, Mr Mayor, thank you. I would like to take this opportunity to update you all on the work we have been doing to develop a new domestic abuse narrative for the borough. As you know, domestic abuse continues to be a significant matter of importance nationally and regionally and locally. It is unacceptable and we will not tolerate any form of domestic abuse in the borough. We have developed a narrative which has been informed by domestic abuse victims, specialists and a wide variety of professionals from the public, private and voluntary sector. The narrative sets out our ambitions and provides a shared framework for a robust action plan to be developed from prevention through to crisis. Our aspiration is to create a borough where people feel safe and happy. Over the last few years, we've made great strides towards achieving this aspiration. Although, although we know there are still an acceptable number of people suffering abuse, the recent COVID-19 pandemic has given rise to several incidents, both locally and nationally, due to increased domestic tensions as people grapple with the wider impact of the virus. This has pushed the issue of domestic abuse to the top of everyone's agenda. Some key facts that show the extent of domestic abuse in Wigan. Each year, nearly 10,000 people in Wigan suffer from domestic abuse. Two thirds of these are female and one third are male victims. Each year, more than 500 people in Wigan are at high and at imminent risk of being murdered or seriously injured as a result of domestic abuse. Women are much more likely than men to be victims of high risk or severe domestic abuse. 92% of victims that have access to IDFA service in Wigan are women. In 2018 to 19, there were 660 children living in homes in Wigan where there, is, where there was a high risk of domestic abuse. The cost of domestic abuse is estimated to be approximately £31 million per year. These figures show that there is still more to be done to stamp out domestic abuse. Over the last few years, there's been significant commitment to financial support invested in our approach to domestic abuse in Wigan Borough. This support has resulted in a mainstream and extended independent domestic violence advocacy team, the commissioning of emergency refuge provision and the creation of specialist abuse safeguarding roles within hospitals. As part of our overall approach to public service reform, a number of additional measures, including the creation of Operation Strive, support low risk victims and families, and the continuation of the Young Persons Violence Advisor resource have also been put in place. While our approach to data has been successful in helping us to respond to domestic abuse incidents quickly to minimise the impact, our aim now is to focus on prevention. Our aim is to remove the obstacles stopping victims from seeking help and to challenge the inequalities that exist. Our approach puts the whole family at its core, ensuring both the victim and the loved ones are protected and supported at the right time, in the right way, by the right person. Where this approach cannot be achieved, we will work hard to intervene at the earliest possible opportunity to prevent the abuse escalating while bringing perpetrators to account quickly. If successful, this approach will help provide long-term sustainable reductions in violence and abuse while driving down future demands and pressure on the system. When this approach is adopted, practice will help to further inform and shape the strategy through awareness, confidence building and training. Our approach will be embedded within a robust governance structure and developed alongside existing services to ensure a one front door approach. We'll work together to break down norms in society to reduce future demand, impact and cost. We aim to make domestic abuse as unacceptable as drink driving or not wearing a seatbelt, both of which were achieved through long term mass mobilisation using various media campaigns with one consistent message, branding and direction. Behind this ambition will be a partnership action plan that holds each agency to account for the critical role they play in achieving these outcomes. This action plan will be governed by the Domestic Abuse Steering Group, with strategic oversight by the Place and Community Safety Partnership Board, aligned to other key strategic governance structures, given its whole system, system approach, and allowing us to pursue cost avoidance for the future. Domestic abuse as a priority for us all has been emphasised during the COVID-19 outbreak, and we will continue to learn from this time which elements have the most impact and the need to be prepared to respond to funding opportunities at regional and national levels in order to maximise income generation for the benefit of us all. I was very disappointed to learn that Tory MPs recently failed to support important amendments which have significantly strengthened the domestic abuse bill which is going through Parliament. These included local MPs James Grundy and Chris Green. These amendments would have ensured the commission of specialist services for the victims and perpetrators of domestic abuse. They will also have ensured that domestic abuse survivors would have had recourse to public funds. This was a lost opportunity to strengthen important legislation. 
Contrast this with the much more proactive approach of this Labour Council, whose leader and Labour group have prioritised investment in domestic abuse services and will con continue to do so. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Uh, thank you for that. There should be no questions on portfolio holders announcements. However, as one councillor has been named, I will allow him to speak, and that is Councillor Grundy, should he wish to. Councillor Grundy, would you like to speak? Thank you, Mr Mayor. Uh, yes, I'd just like to uh, uh, say to Councillor Anderson, uh, with regards to the amendments that were voted down, it's not because they were necessarily opposed, it's because the government was carrying out a review into those measures, uh, as mentioned by Minister Atkins at the dispatch box, and the government will bring forward new measures to deal with those issues in due course. But I'm happy to set the record straight. Thank you very much, Mr Mayor. Thank you for that, Councillor Grundy. I will now move on to uh, invite the portfolio holder for communities, public relations, corporate land, community assets and culture, Councillor Reader, to speak about the work that the hubs have done during the lockdown period and offer thanks to the staff and the community. Councillor Reader. Thank you, Mr. Moore, for allowing me to speak. Uh, I was going to start off by saying in March, we didn't know what, what was ahead of us and none of us would have predicted that. And tonight we thought it was going to be plain sailing. We would have never predicted a lightning coming across the town hall and striking you out, Mr. Moore. But clearly you're back here uh, and smiling with us. Uh, on a serious note, uh, back in March when um, when everything hit us uh, and the community hubs set up, so you got the SDF and the community teams pulling together, we did that within a matter of hours. It was unbelievable the kind of thing that happened straight away, but that wasn't just those two teams together, that was elected members working with them, volunteers, residents, you name it, all Wigan pulled together. It was an absolute unbelievable and lots of members have contacted me and said their hub was the best and the best work was done in their place. I've got to tell you that I travelled across the borough uh, and another chief executive and, and the leader in certain points and everybody did a fantastic job. It, we couldn't have done it any better. Uh, what Talking to people across the North West and sometimes across the country on Teams and Skype meetings, they hadn't got the infrastructure that we had in place in communities. They had to start from a standing still uh, start there. So they had to build that before they could get in and, and do the work. And I've got to commend uh, the former leader, Councillor Peter Smith, and the, and the leader now, Councillor David Mullineux, because the infrastructure that we put into communities in 2010 and SIF funding, and when we've looked at some of the figures, 95% of the groups that we funded was imminent in helping out in this crisis. So that just shows it was the right thing to do and was really positive. On, on a note of a wider scale, and I know a few members are going to speak about the staff in their departments, and I know the leader's going to touch on the borough. I was so proud. And when you get comments from residents all over saying how proud they were of the staff of Wigan, who carried on emptying the bins, doing all the stuff what we took for granted with a smile on the face, and recently opening Wigan and Lee Libraries, which was a massive thing to do for us. The staff were chomping at the bit to actually do that. It was amazing just the enthusiasm they wanted to do and do it for the people of Wigan. I've got lots and lots of case studies which have been sent through to me, but what I wanted to just touch on a couple really was the contact that the, the staff and volunteers have made with the residents out there who were shielding and needed help. So in one instance, it was a, a weekly call to a guy who was blind. So when they rang him on the Monday, he'd actually he'd collapsed and he'd been on the floor for four hours. So we moved straight into action there to kind of get him out, and get him out there and get him to hospital and probably saved his life. I don't know the full details of it. When he came round, we carried on making that contact with him through the hospitals. He was worried about his pets. So he had a pet budgie and a rat, believe it or not, Mr. Murr. And he was worried about them. And what did we do? We got in touch with the Iron Forces Hub. We put people in place and we looked after his animals. That meant a lot to him. But it's also just actually that being there and helping him. And at Councillor Anderson's touch on domestic violence, we've dealt with lots of domestic violence cases over this period. And one instance where somebody had to flee domestic violence, had no food, no money, 
we helped that person. But we also did it in a professional way where the location wasn't given away. And what how we did that, we did that with the expertise of the people who was redeployed using their expertise in their own jobs, but in this, this instance. So to all the redeployed staff who really took it on board and actually worked their socks off, there's so much good work being done. You know, it, it, it kind of beggars belief, but I've got to say, politics are one side, all elected members, some were shielding, so couldn't do too much, but they actually did a lot of the phone call stuff. But all across the political divide, people was involved in this and they put politics at one side. So I've got to hold my hand up for that. And I think it was Wigan, Wigan at its best and was still doing it, led by the leader. And I've said the former leader, if we had to put that in place, maybe it wouldn't be here. So thanks to all them people. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for that. I'll just remind members that these presentations are not open to questions. So I will now invite three portfolio holders and finally the deputy leader and then the leader to speak about the work within their areas. And I'd like to call on Councillor Raymond first, if you're available, Councillor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and good evening, everyone. Colleagues, no doubt we are going through the most aggressive and prevalent threat to human life in modern history. The COVID-19 pandemic has been unprecedented in every way. It has required an emergency response which has touched every part of this council. All of our services from environment to business support, from our contact centres to the service delivery footprint teams, HR and OD to children and adult social care. We all have worked as a team to keep our residents safe. Senior leaders, politicians, staff, volunteers and community organisations have worked hand in hand in what should be called a mammoth response to this crisis. From delivering hundreds of thousands of pieces of PPE to frontline staff, delivering food to those in need across the borough, or small acts of kindness through welfare calls or dropping off books to lonely and shielded residents. Soon after the lockdown was announced, we set up a borough-wide distribution centre for food and PPE, supported by our environmental team and the Wigan Armed Forces Hub, acting as the central logistic team distributing food and goods across the borough. Building on the principles of the deal and our successful place-based model, we were able to set up seven coordination hubs in our service delivery footprints, where our STF managers and teams worked closely with mutual aid groups and volunteers to support our local communities. We established a new helpline and an online self-isolation form for vulnerable residents. Between 1st of April and 27th of July this year, we dealt with over 14,500 requests for medicines, food parcels, hot meals and other support, and over 7,000 residents were supported directly from our STFs. Our ward councillors have been instrumental in supporting their local communities. They have also used their brighter borough fund of about £26,000 to assist local organisations and community groups to fund additional food, transport and welfare needs. To respond effectively, we had to harness the skills and capabilities of our paid and unpaid workforce. We have redeployed 800 staff from different services into our critical COVID-19 response team. Our facilities and IT department ensured that staff is supported to work agile and in many cases from home while keeping safe. Our communication team has done a brilliant job by keeping residents and staff up to date with changing guidance and regulations, providing advice and reassurance and keeping us all connected at a time of great fear and isolation for many of us. Our digital team has worked tirelessly facilitating thousands of virtual meetings. They ensured that we can reconvene our political meeting cycles and democratic, democratic processes. They supported the democratic team to deliver the first online council meeting today. And thanks to the lightning and storm, they, it has made it more interesting and memorable. I'd like to extend my thanks to all our staff without their flexibility and willingness to work in a new field, new working geography and on the front line, we wouldn't have been able to achieve so much. We all are indebted to you. Also, I extend my thanks to all volunteers and community sector partners 
who always go that extra mile. We recruited over 700 new volunteers who we hope will continue to work with us in the future. A big thank you to our business rates and finance team who have managed to pay just over 20 million pounds to 2000 businesses in small business grants. Over 5000 business grants have been issued so far, but above all, we've been overwhelmed by the kindness shown by local businesses and organizations who wanted to support our COVID-19 efforts. Generous donations from Lee Centurion Rugby Club, BNM Bargains, Morrison's, Primo's Italian and Heinz are just a few among hundreds of individuals and businesses who we are grateful to. I would also like to thank the residents of this borough who have been adhering to guidelines and are being careful. We need you to continue to do so. And finally, I would like to say a heartiest thank you to our leader. David's tenacity, ingenuity and a grounded attitude has kept the staff and elected members focused, informed, optimistic and safe. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for that, Councillor Raymond. I will now call on Councillor Bullen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor, I can assure you that through the recent pandemic period, the directorate has been extremely busy supporting children and families across the borough. First, I'd like to mention our schools. In the lockdown period, all schools within the borough remained open to support key worker children and those who required additional support. Within Greater Manchester, Wigan had the highest proportion of children with social workers in schools and the highest proportion of children with education, health and care plans attending our schools. Our early learning and childcare team have been working hard to support our childcare providers. Those who were able to remain open during lockdown and with business support and guidance for those who did not open. Many families were helped to find essential childcare if they weren't able to access their usual provider. All this amazing work has only been achieved with great partnership and teamwork across our schools, early help, education and social workers. Thank you to all of them for their determination to get the best outcomes for our children. Currently, the directorate is working with schools, colleges and partners in preparing to fully open safely for all children and young people in September. This is a challenging time for schools, staff, governors, children and families, but one that the team are embracing. I want to acknowledge the amazing Wigan Youth Zone project that was in place for 13 weeks supporting around 60 young people and providing respite for their carers. Our partners from Wigan Athletic and Inspiring Healthy Lifestyle led on sports and exercise sessions. <clears throat> Thank you so much to everyone who was involved with this project and in particular Graham Doubleday and Councillor Susan Gambles for their enthusiastic support. <clears throat> Excuse me. Currently, the Startwell service are working in collaboration with our partners to run summer holiday camps to support children across the borough. Priority places were offered to those children who needed them most. The summer camps offer physical and well-being activities, along with a healthy lunch provided by Metro Fresh. Targeted support has continued throughout for children in care. <clears throat> We have refreshed and refocused our fostering recruitment. We developed a fast track fostering scheme for council employees and I'm delighted that 11 colleagues have stepped forward to become new Wigan foster carers. I'm pleased to report that we recruited Colette Dutton as Director of Children and Family Services. <coughs> so sorry. Colette brings with her a wealth of experience from local authority and other public sector agencies. She will be focusing initially on developing our improvement plan for children's social care, 
in response to feedback received from Ofsted over the last 18 months. We're working hard to ensure that we have everything in place to enable staff to deliver consistently good work across the service. I want to say a special thank you to social workers and children and young people's family workers who've provided essential support across children's social care, supporting our most vulnerable children and families. They have gone over and beyond what is expected of them to ensure the best outcomes and that our children feel safe. Finally, Mr Mayor, I would like to thank all the officers who were deployed during this uncertain period, whether that was colleagues from children and families who were deployed out to support other critical teams or those who came into our directorate from across the council. They have told us that this experience has allowed them to build new relationships which will continue in the long term. The true be kind spirit of our Wigan colleagues has shone through at this time. I'm extremely proud of the work of the Children and Families Directorate. I want to thank everyone for their hard work, determination and caring support. Without their help, we would not have been able to continue to provide effective critical services. Oh, sorry, in there, Councillor Bullen. I am sorry, but you have run out of time. Okay. In you. these critical times. <laughs> Last Thank three you. words, Mr Mayor. Thank you. I can now call on Councillor Paul Prescott. Are you there, Paul? I'm still with you, Mr Mayor. I hope you're, uh, you're not tingling too much from the lightning strike. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Mayor, for permission to speak tonight. Can I just say that the last five months I've seen Wigan Council respond to a major health crisis with operations having to change and adapt as never before to meet the needs of residents. However, the response from all of our services has been exemplary from day one and none more than that of our environmental services who have gone above and beyond to ensure frontline critical services were delivered with little disruption. I personally think that the unforeseen consequences of the COVID emergency has highlighted the importance of our waste collection service and the multiple challenges it's presented to our teams, given the geographical size of the borough with over 200,000 domestic waste bins due for collection every single week. And if you put that together with the additional increase of some 20% more waste to be collected during this period, with the borough amassing in one week alone on one occasion, 3,000 tonnes of rubbish, you can see the scale of the task that the service faced. After extensive preparation and planning, Wigan became the first local authority to reopen its recycling centres to the public in April. And we did so to help households manage additional waste produced during the lockdown restrictions. Like everything else we did, when we have reopened, we have done so with the health of our residents as our number one priority. And I can assure you all that this, this, these decisions were taken only when we could ensure that we could do so without, while reducing the risk of spreading the virus. During this period, our waste and road teams have ensured a safe transition into what we now call the new normal. Last week saw the 200,000 vehicle drive through the gates of our recycle centres that gives an average of some 13,000 weekly visits since April. The opening of the centres also had been critical in the reduction of environmental crimes, with fly tipping down by some 90%. I would like to offer my thanks to Member of the okay. uh, As part of the deal, we are encouraging residents to dispose of their waste to dispose of their waste responsibly. We believe that fixed penalties, set an appropriate rate, will provide an effective and visible way of responding to environmental crime. During the pandemic, we've been working hard to explore sustainable transport alternatives for residents to utilise into the future. And the last few months have already seen changes such as temporarily extended pedestrian zone times in Wigan and Lee Town centres. The introduction of 20 MPH speed limits 
on some town centre roads and extended op operational times to bus lanes and there are plans in place to introduce cycle friendly schemes into the borough. Wigan Council wants to ensure that all our road users have access to a high quality road network and we will ensure our walking and cycling facilities also meet those high standards to encourage sustainable modes of transport. The necessary redeployment of staff to frontline services meant that the community in the borough as we develop our climate change strategy. While the core, while the core grass cutting service will be unaffected, areas like Nolly Old Quarry, Lodge Road Playing Field and Amberswood Common could be the new home for wildlife and wildflowers for years to come. So coming towards the end of what I have to say, what's next? Well, the next 12 months are set to see a big step forward in the council's environmental journey as despite COVID-19 forcing us to postpone our inaugural climate change conference in June, next year we'll see the council accelerating ahead to add to the progress we have already made. Not only are we set to reveal our new environmental campaign later this year, but an ambitious climate change strategy. In finishing, I would like to add that the pandemic has clearly focused our attention on how beneficial a more sustainable way of living can be for us all. And Wigan Council remain as committed as ever to ensuring that the borough is a cleaner, greener and safer place to live for all its residents. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you for that, Councillor Prescott. Can I now move on to Deputy Leader, Councillor Cunliffe, please. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, can I just, and a couple of members have mentioned this in their, in their previous uh, statements, but um, the what our staff have done during this five months during this crisis has been absolutely amazing and i do get involved in authorities across the country and and talk to people across the country uh, and i think our staff have been really significant in and outstanding in the way they've dealt with this and sort of the behaviors we ask of them to be positive be accountable be courageous and be kind they have shown that all the way through this and of course, I think that's partly to do with, and I think we're very lucky to have Councillor Molyneux as a leader and, and Alison Mackenzie Fallon as chief exec, because I think their leadership during this crisis, during the last five months, has been truly outstanding. And, and I recognise the pressure and stress they've all been under. Um, so in adult social care, our staff have really stepped up to the mark. If you remember at the beginning of the um, uh, of the uh, crisis and when lockdown came in March, the national uh, distribution of PPE was absolutely shambolic. And this council is one of the few councils that immediately started to supplement national uh, and regional provision of PPE. The reason why? Because so many of our people receive adult social care, over 2,000 people in care homes, staff working in there. And so to get that PPE right in from the beginning, this council paying that, which many councils didn't. The National Audit Office have estimated that 25,000 people were discharged from hospital into care homes without being tested for COVID-19. Bearing in mind that care homes have the most vulnerable and older people who have been most impacted by COVID. So we ended up with a situation whereby the government in protecting the NHS and not seeing the NHS and social care as a tall system. But I really do think that when I talk about it as a whole system and care homes came under a lot of uh, pressure, uh, and we recognise that social care is more than care homes for the elderly. It's about home care and domiciliary care. It's about supported housing for people with mental health problems, people with learning disabilities, people with autism. And they have been impacted significantly by this crisis and need that support. Um, and of course, what happened was 
as P as the care homes started to get more and more cases of uh, COVID-19, staff of course, and I, and I have to say that in complimenting and saying our staff are outstanding, I have to recognise the outstanding performance from those staff on very low pay who work in care homes, who work in domiciliary care, who were not employees of the council, but employed in the social care sector. And that's why it was really important for us to buy PPE, to put squads. We, uh, uh, what we had was because of some of our staff were redeployed, we developed three squads to go in and support care homes who were, who were, uh, who were suffering from uh, you know, high sickness and absence from staff or particular problems or high rates. So using our staff to do that, to go and support those people was uh, was really good. One thing that did come out was um, the Mercure Hotel. We took over the Mercure Hotel. Now, part of that was around uh, the government giving councils, local authorities money to deal with people who were homeless and rough sleepers. And so we we took over some of the Mercury Hotel, but we also used it one for people rough sleepers and homelessness, but also people who were in difficulty in terms of drug and alcohol services, and also used some of the upper floors for people who were being discharged from hospital having suffered from COVID, but were not suitable for going home, and some people who were really struggling with complex needs and complex dependency during the period. What that has taught us is there is actually a different way of working because by having those people in the Mercure with NHS services, with council services, with housing, with employment, with physical health and all those and employment services, by a, by being able to concentrate well, all those services. But I'm just saying that oh, that's indicated a new way of working. I'm afraid. I can now call on the leader, Councillor Mullinex. Thank, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I think I think in more ways than one, it will certainly be a meeting that we'll always rem remember. Uh, first, because it's been a virtual, the lightning, uh, and, and certainly for your length of service, Mr. Mayor. I think you've now just become uh, the longest-serving mayor in the borough's history. And I congratulate you on that. Can I just say that when we were all elected, I never thought, none of us ever thought that and I envisaged that we'd have to deal with a crisis such as that we are still dealing with. And I can tell you now that I have recently, uh, through th through the internet and through through on this screen, spoken to well over 700 members of staff. And I've thanked each and every one of them personally on your behalf. Uh, because I think it's significant in what you've heard from portfolio, portfolio holders tonight, uh, the amount of work and the amount of effort that has gone in. Can I just say, um, I did mention it very early on during this pandemic, that politics go through the window at times like this. And I'd like to thank you all personally, and I know many of you across the political spectrum have been out there working in your communities, supporting people, and certainly making a difference to people's lives. And I wouldn't have expected anything less uh, because that's what we are. I certainly think moving forward, the world has changed. It's changed in a very short period of time. Uh, and one can think back to the visions that we had as we announced the budget at our last council meeting in terms of what we wanted to do and what we want to deliver. Can I just say the experience that we've had in terms of delivering the deal? has certainly made a difference to how Wigan performed. We increased our volunteers base by over 700 volunteers. That is significant. And what we want to do is retain that volunteer force uh, because it's important as we come out of this and start to rebuild. I think it's critical and I've listened to Jenny tonight about not closing our schools. That was so important to a lot of young people, vulnerable young people, people of frontline workers, because what I want to ensure as we come out of this, that we don't have a lost generation. And we've got to make sure in Wigan that we create the best opportunities for those young people to progress in education, many of whom will be waiting to hear uh, what the results are this Thursday. And I know how critical that is to them. And we need to make sure that we support that. 
Can I just say that Wigan will come out of this stronger? We have to. I think we owe it as, as, as politicians to the people we represent. And that is why we come here week in, week out, uh, trying to do our best and trying to support the people of this borough. I'm certainly proud of the efforts that have gone on and there were many efforts and there are so many people uh, to thank and there are so many people we should be proud of. I'm not going to repeat everything that's been said tonight, Mr. Murr. You've heard it firsthand and I certainly agree with the comments that have been made by my, my cabinet members. So from me, can I thank you as, as the Mayor of this town and certainly thank all the members for the efforts that have gone in over this last period of time since March and certainly we need to thank our staff who I consider to be the best staff in local government. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and that probably sums up the end of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you for that, Councillor Molinex. In moving the following reports, I will assume that all the seconders will reserve the right to speak at the end of the other speakers. So we will now move on to constitutional issues. The virtual meeting procedure update. We have a report on pages 23 to 36 of the agenda, which asks the Council to formally accept the virtual meeting procedure rules that have been in place since April 2020. I invite the Leader to move the recommendations. Leader. Privileged uh, to move those minutes, Mr. Mayor, but we need to put something in there about thunder and lightning, I think. Thank you very much. Is the recommendation seconded? Seconded, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Deputy Leader, do any other members wish to contribute? Councillor Brealey. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Am I online? Yes, you're on. No, no. Yeah, this item seems to be very interesting. Um, that item on the agenda, uh, item uh, paragraph three, were Councillor Rigby, uh, Councillor Dewars, and Councillor Winston. is recommending these uh, so called uh, agreeing working group, whatever. Why is there no independent member going to recommendations and stuff like this? You know what I mean? It just seems whatever. Anyway, going on. Going on to the. Councillor, can I just interrupt? I think you're on the wrong report. No, I'm talking not. about the virtual meeting procedure update. We're on, we're on constitutional issues. Yeah. Six, yeah, that's what Six, I'm on. A, a virtual meeting procedure update. Talking you're talking about B. We've not come to that yet. Right. So I'm talking about B. No, you're not talking about B. We've not come to it yet. OK, then, fair enough. Fair enough. Right, can I ask? Can, do you wish oh, to speak on this? No. All right. I will call you in on, on the, the one you said. I've now got Councillor Jones to speak on this. Councillor, are you with us? Oh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I'd also like to congratulate you on being the longest serving mayor. David beat me to that one. Uh, just double checking. Uh, last time I checked, I was a member of the constitutional group. Unless I'm mistaken, then I apologise. Could you ask someone to have a look? Because uh, I don't think I was notified about this meeting, speaking about these issues. So I'll, I'll leave it. At, I'll leave it at that. If someone could get back to me after meeting, that'd be great. Yeah. So, yeah. so Councillor, I think there wasn't a meeting as such. It was just to formalise the rules. Yeah. Well, I'm. Councillor, I can't hear you. Steve, you're Sorry. muted. Sorry, Sorry okay. Mr. Mayor. Listen, I'll not, I'll not keep you on this one, but if I'm a member of the constitutional group, yes, this is a constitutional issue. Yeah. Right. I'll, Mr. Mayor, I'm having a bad connection, so I'll leave it at that, but if you could ask someone to get back to me on it, thank you. Yes, OK, will do. I have Councillor George Davis. Councillor Davis, are you there? You're muted, Councillor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Perhaps you're up. Yeah, can I just uh, uh, 
um, mention about over the last uh, couple of months when we started doing our training exercises on our laptops for the visual programs. But can I also mention our buddies, the great, uh, the, you know, the staff out there who's done absolutely brilliant for every one of us. So just to, you know, mention about, you know, this, what I call a training exercise, but it is working. And uh, but the main thing is to thank everybody who's helped us all. So thank you very much, Mr. Moore. Uh, thank you for that, Councillor. I don't seem to have any for anyone else. No. Deputy Leader, do you wish to speak on this? No, thank you. Leader, do you wish to sum up on this? No, I think we're okay, Mr. Moore. Thank you. OK, then I would like to put the report to the vote. Can all those against the approval of the report please show in the chat facility, please? We have no one against that, that report, so that's passed. Sorry, Councillor Brealey's voted against. Sorry, there was a bit of a delay on this end. We'll now move on to B, response to the local government associations draft code of conduct for elected members. We have a report on pages 37 to 62 of the agenda, which asks the council to seek members approval to the proposed response and the standards working group to the consultation of the local government association on the draft model code of conduct for elected members. I invite the leader to move the recommendation. Leader. Pleasure to move, Mr. Mayor. Is the recommendation seconded? Seconded, Mr. Mayor, and reserve the right to speak. OK. Do any other members wish to contribute? I've already got you, Councillor Brealey. I think Councillor Jones wants to speak on this item, so we'll go to Councillor Jones first. Hello, Mr. Mayor. Can, can you hear me this time? Yes. Yes, oh, we brilliant. I, I must admit, Mr. Mur, I was reading this and it's embarrassing. In times like this, when we're all thanking each other, saying it's not political, what we see is certain civil servants in this council obsessed with trying to control, dictate and get rid of councillors who you can't get rid of at the ballot box. Now, I noticed very interestingly the individual putting this forward so happens to be a Labour peer, which uh, a Labour Lord, I should say, which I can imagine where he got his influence from. Now, before you stop me, I know we're responding to this individual, but they, a lot of this has been done by letters in the past sent by this council asking for this type of stuff. Please, please Mr. Murdo, don't, don't shut me down. I can see you getting advice. Now, of two problems I have with this. No, about you, What's that story? I'm not so getting a pass on you, councillor. Keep talking. Right, thank, thank you. So at one time, what we had before the Localism Act was where if a councillor was bad behaved, it went in front of a judge. More times than not, very rarely councillors got this six month sack and unpaid. What you're recommending here is that one of our kangaroo courts has the power to sack an elected member, and I'll remind the individual who's, give, who's been in the ear of this other Labour Lord, last time he used his influence to sack a councillor, it made him irrelevant and that's why he's no longer leader. And to the civil servants that keep pushing this, you're not going to get rid of Councillor Briley. He's going to keep winning his elections. Stop thinking you can dictate to councillors. That's pretty much all I've got to say, Mr Mayor. Thank you very much. All right, I have, I have now got Councillor Brealey on the list to speak. Councillor Brealey. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Uh, yeah, all these proposals were thrown out by, under the Localism Act by Lord Pittles, Eric Pittles, because of the outrageous councils who were spending vast amounts of money on hearings trying to bully elected members who don't comply to what they want us to do. Now, 
obviously, you know, the, the, what, what it does show this is all them, all them sanctions placed on me was illegal. And it's nothing more than another witch hunt by legal officers giving advice to uh, elected members trying to get rid of the localism act which was put in place by the House of Parliament. Now I can't see this ever been happening. I've been writing to this modern code of conduct and explaining and giving them evidence and you know it's, it's an absolute disgrace. Now the two powers that be, the two legal people, has extended these sanctions without going through a standard hearing. In 2016 they did it and they did it again in 2020 and it's an appalling situation that members have been put through this with bogus complaints but yet there's nothing in this documentation of a duty of care to elected members. So why, why is that not being put in? Now the duty of care is where council protect elected members but at some hearings I've been to, the, the, the complainant has got legal support, outside legal support, paid for by the council, and we're going in, green as grass, with no support whatsoever. But it, it, it just seems to go, keep going on and on and on and on. But, you know, it will come to an end, because like I said, I'm writing to the, to the, um, the people, and I'm going to write to Eric Pickles as well, because Donna Hall did this, sent a letter to, the, to, to Eric Pickles and he threw it out. So why are you trying again? You're nothing more than a bullying council and it's huge bullying harassment. These, uh, these officers are a disgrace and it's been proven by Operation Florit over what the lies and the, what they're prepared to do to tell lies to get elected members struck off. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Thank you. Councillor Brealey, I've now got Councillor Winston Lee. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, obviously, this is a response to the local government uh, association's consultation. And actually, this uh, consultation is open to every single member of the council. So I would urge every single of the mem member of this council to actually take part in that survey and give their feedback because the best consultations are the ones that most people take part in so that when the LGA consider all the responses they've got a good representation and flavour of what members are actually thinking. So whilst this will be a recommendation from this council. I urge every single member of this council to actually go and complete that survey and put their views forward to the local government association and have their say. That's all I want to say. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Winston. -Lay. I now have Councillor Maiden. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, could I just thank uh, Nick Iam and all these uh, Democratic Service Team for putting this together. I know how hard work it is and then it's shut down and all that. So I'd just like to thank Nick. I could see him running around and he's done a great job. Yeah, back to the point we're all talking about. Uh, Steve Jones and Bob have really covered it, really. Well, what I can't understand about this, it's not really legally binding. It's just a waste of everybody's time and effort again. And the issue, I, I mean, you talk about Bob Barley having code of conduct. I've actually had more code of conduct in against me than Bob has but I've, had, I've not had them go to an hearing. And they're absolutely nonsense. It's, I get code of conduct in against me because you've beaten a Labour Party member in a debate, they're offended. Now, who determines whether I should be suspended for six months or something like that? It's utterly ridiculous. And if you're talking about this legal team and this monitoring officer, whether he determines I'm out of order, he needs to look at his own record. This is a guy who was orchestrated in having four councillors' doors, former councillor doors, kicked off, and he's still under investigation, and I still don't know why he's doing with a job in this town hall, setting bail conditions for people before they were arrested. It's all going to come out, so you might as well hear it here first. It's not councillors like independents who should be suspended for six months. It's the legal officers here. It's the people who are putting in lies in code of conduct. Can I just interrupt you there, councillor? Can I bring in... 
the solicitor to give us some legal advice. Yeah, of course. Janet Davis, would you like to speak on this? Give us some advice. Good evening, Mayor. Um, I'd like to reiterate two points, really. One is that this is not a Wigan uh, driven procedure at all. The Committee on Standards in Public Life in 2019 published a report that made recommendations to change the Members' Code of Conduct. And within those recommendations was a recommendation that the Local Government Association drafted a model code of conduct that will be used nationally. What we've done is all authorities and individuals are being consulted on this proposed national mo model code of conduct. Uh, please, Mayor, could Councillor Jones not interrupt me when I'm speaking? There is a Sorry. set procedure Sorry. for some chat can buttons. Miss Davis, can I just interrupt you there, please? Councillor Jones has raised a point of order, which means everything has to stop. Can I remind Councillor Jones that point of order is relating to an alleged breach of the council rules. Can I ask which council rules have been breached? Councillor, you're muted. I'm, I'm sorry, Councillor, we can't hear you. Mr. Mayor. Hello, no. Mr. Mayor. It, the rule that's been broken is yes. civil servants can civil servants cannot speak in the chamber. If you look at Parliament, Chancellor. a civil servant cannot speak in, par Chancellor. in Parliament, especially Chancellor. a civil servant that's Can been accused of the very things. Can I interrupt you for a moment? Or political opinion. First, first of all, this is not Parliament, it's the Council, and I have asked the solicitors for legal advice because people seem to be talking on something which it, it's not put before us. So, so Councillor, you, you're muted. I'm sorry, it's not me, it's you. You're muted. I can't hear you. <laughs> I'm sorry, Councillor, nobody can hear you. Can I ask you, can I ask Miss Davis to continue with her legal advice, please? Thank you, Chair. As I was saying, this the it is a national code of conduct that's been proposed and that we were invited as our own individuals are to comment on this. It is not a Wigan driven procedure at all. Finally, can I please comment that the matter that is being discussed is purely the response from the council to the consultation. I think the comments from Councillor Maiden are not relevant to the issues in hand. It is not driven, as I say, by Wigan. His comments aren't relevant to the issue. And as Councillor Winstanley's pointed out, that. Because can I, can 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 not to mention councillors, please. I Thank ask councillors not. I ask councillors not to mention. In conduct in right. As Councillor Wynne Stanley has also pointed out, and I think this is a very important point, that all members present tonight have the opportunity to respond to the consultation individually or collectively as they see appropriate. Thank you, Mayor. Right. Thank you. Can I ask? Coun Councillor Maiden, you're muted. We interrupted you to take legal advice. Can I ask Councillor Maiden to continue, please? I'm, I'm not muting myself. Somebody else is muting it. Yeah, I don't oh, know how much it should. worked, but that, I know you asked Janet for legal advice there. That wasn't legal advice. It was political advice. So It wasn't political. Councillor. Yeah, it was. It was subjective it's, opinion. What we're, what we're discussing is what's come from uh, government and something we yeah, have but to the back, to. It's being backed by this council, isn't it? I mean, they've all put the little it's caveat. It's a consultation, it? councillor, and you have the opportunity oh, to give I've seen the word is in the document. What we're, what we're debating here, Mr. Councillor, councillor Breely, you've already spoken on this. I've, I've said what I need to say, Mr. Burr, so thanks for your time. Okay. It's great. Uh, uh, Councillor Brealey, you've spoken on this once and you can't speak again. I'm now asking Councillor Gerard to speak. Councillor Gerard, are you there? Thank you, Mr. Matt. Uh, yeah, looking through this report, uh, it clearly states right at the beginning, saying uh, none at this. What are the legal implications? It says none at this stage 
Although with the draft code of conduct comes into force, arrangements will have to be made for the council to adopt the code into its constitution. Now, I'm a member of the constitution uh, group, and this is this is all news to me. So I'm just wondering if we vote on this tonight, is that adopt? Is it adopted tonight, or will it have to go to the constitution working group first before it comes back to the council? I think what we're voting on is whether it should be open up to consultation. Councillor, which will give you the opportunity to speak on it. Right, OK. Make contribution. Right. Thanks, Matt. I think uh, we've got some more legal advice, so. Solicitor, Janet Davis, could I ask you to speak, please? I apologise, Mayor, there seems to be a delay when I, uh, I click the mute button. I just want to reiterate uh, that, that I was not offering any political opinion. What I'm trying to do and what I think everybody needs to be aware when making a decision is that the you are being asked tonight to indicate whether you agree with the comments that the Audit Standards and Governance Committee proposed to make in response to the draft model code of conduct. The draft model code of conduct would be implemented nationally, but it would come back to the council who would have the option of having any amendments that they feel as a council they would need. Uh, thank you thank for you. that. Thanks, Mayor. I have no one else, so I'm asking the deputy leader if he would like to speak. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Just to make a few points. Um, I think there's some misunderstanding between what this is. This is a consultation, a national consultation on a proposed draft code of conduct. And any councillor can respond to that consultation. So individually, we can all, so Councillor Braley, Councillor Maiden, Councillor Jones can all respond to that consultation. This is about our response as a council to the consultation. But if any of this was to be enacted, it would have to be done at a national level. And then at a later date, if this council wished to amend some of the draft uh, uh, draft regulation, then we could do. But we're a long way off that. This code will have to be agreed nationally. And then, so it should be for government to indicate this, so it will come at some later point. So this is only a consultation. So if people want to, and we as a council are, are, are responding in this way, but if any individual member wants to contribute to that consultation, they're quite entitled to do so. And then we'll await and see what the national guidance is. OK, can I now move on to leader? Do you wish to sum up on this? Yeah, th thank you, Mr. Mayor. And it's a shame that it, it it kind of went to the level it went to at certain stages during that conversation. And I think some of the advice that's been given, Councillor Winstonley was very clear, and Councillor Councillor Cunliffe was very clear, and Councillor Jared asked a very pertinent question. Please listen to what they've just told you. This is your opportunity to be involved in a in a consultation. In a lot of ways, this is some of the stuff that you've been asking for to be consulted on. This is your opportunity to do that. And I have pleasure in moving the report, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Right. Can I now put the report to the vote? Can all those against the approval of the report please show in the chat facility, please? Against. Do I need to announce the result? Yeah. yeah. Right, I have two abstentions and one up. Oh, sorry, three abstentions. They come in a bit later. One, two, three. I have now got four abstentions and one against. So the report is five abstentions. I think the report's been accepted and we'll give the results. Sorry, councillor. I'm afraid we have to move on from this item there. The review of council meetings. The council is asked to... 
Councillor, I'm going to have to ask, ask you to be quiet. Review, we're moving on. Review of council meetings. The council is asked to consider the following changes to future council meetings in view of the current COVID-19 climate to move the current 9th of September meeting to the 21st of October 2020 to include the mayor making for 2021 at 3 p.m. which will be followed by the ordinary meeting. To move the meeting scheduled to be held on the 2nd of December to the 16th of December 2020 at 6 p.m. I invite the leader to move the recommendations. Leader. Pleasure to move, Mr. Mayor. Are these changes seconded? I'd like to second, Mr. Mayor, and reserve the right to speak if necessary. Do any other members wish to contribute on this item? I think I'm still getting votes on the previous item, but uh, it, that looks like that's been accepted. Now move on to D, local authority governors. The council is requested to approve the nominations for the appointment and reappointment of school governors as set out on pages 63 and 68 of the council agenda. Are these nominations moved? Pleasure to move, Mr. Mayor. Are these nominations seconded? Pleasure to second, Mr. Mayor. Do any other members wish to contribute? No one, it doesn't look like it. So can I put this straight to the vote? Can all those against the approval of the report please show in the chat facility, please? We're all for that. Nobody against. We have no one against, so that has passed. The item E, monitoring of urgent items and exemptions from calling. Members are requested to note the key decisions that have been taken as urgent items and those that have been made exempt from calling since the last report to Council. These decisions are included on pages 69 to 76 of your agenda. Members are requested to note these decisions. There's no debate on it. Item seven, policy and budget framework items, treasury management, annual review and capital programme. At pages 77 to 106, we have a report that provides members with an update on the treasury management activity for the council. The report was considered by the Audit Governance and Standards Committee and the Cabinet at their recent meetings. I invite Councillor Raymond to move the recommendation. Wish to move, Mr Mayor. Is the recommendation seconded? Uh, back to second, Mr Mayor, and reserve the right to speak. Do any other members wish to contribute on this item? Yes, Mr Mayor. I don't have anything, anybody who wishes to contribute, so. Deputy Leader, do you wish to say anything? Uh, leader, do you wish to say anything? Because I'll have to ask Councillor Raymond to sum up after you've had your say. I'm quite Councilor, happy to second it, uh, Mr. Mayor. Oh, I'm, sorry, I'm, not, I'm sorry, sorry for the delay. We've got someone who wishes to speak. So before you start, Councillor Breeley, would you like to speak on this item? Yes, Mr. Mayor, I would, yeah. Um, it's been brought to my attention that certain finances of this council are being paid for under general governance matters, which is disguising the payments made with, a, with an invoice. It happened in, in 2016, and I believe it's happened again in uh, 2018. Why is the, why, what is this, what is general governance matters? Now I've asked the uh, finance officer to send me all payments made on the general governance matters because it sounds like public money is being squandered here and not being given the correct procedure of paying for them items with the correct payment which it set out and anything paid over £500 from government legislation. Can I, can I, can somebody answer me the question? I've asked Mr McKevitt 
to send me all this information and he's not he's refusing to acknowledge my emails which gives me very i'm very suspicious now as to what is being paid under this general governance matters and why is it being paid under it now in 2016 a solicitor charged this council £35,000 for a month's work, which was paid under general governance matters. Now we believe a security system, which was placed on Donna Hall's private house, who lives totally outside of Greater Manchester, totally outside Wigan Borough. Councillor, Councillor Brealy, can I ask oh. you to, to stick to this, please? The council finances are audited every year. Are we talk about council finances or not? It seems like when I ask awkward questions, everybody's running real like an headless chicken and you don't want to answer the questions. Well, I've been elected to hold the executive to accountability. Now we want answers. Why is a security system been paid for under general right, government? So that does not come under Treasury management annual review it and the comes under finance of this council. Councillor, I'm sorry I'm going to have to interrupt you there. If you're not going to ask questions on this item, I'm going to have to ask you to be quiet. Thank you very much. Finance, Mr Moore. It's, it's Wigan Council it's not Finance. Just finance Council. It's the Treasury Management Annual Review and Capital Programme. Yeah, but there's no, we're discussing. There's no, we're not discussing. There's no provision of general governance matters. We're not discussing what is being paid? I'm sorry to interrupt you, Councillor. But we're not discussing things from 2016. That is not the item under the discussion. So well, I'm going to have to ask you to stick to the point, Can you get Paul McKenna to give me some answers? I understand that the Chief Executive has already responded to you on this item. Well, she's not. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Mr. Murray, she's not. Well, I'm saying she has, Councillor. That's the information I've got. Well, it's false because I've not got it. Well, I shall find out whether it's true or not. Okay. Okay, okay thank you, Mr. Mayor. Right, we've now got Councillor Maiden who wishes to speak on this. Councillor Maiden. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It's just a short, quick query. We've had £3 million off at central government to help traders and business people in the town to help with this COVID-19 crisis. Has it been spent that yet? And if it's not, can we please at least have a consultation and a review of the market rents? I mean, I'm all constantly papping on about this and all the market traders, they need a break. The footfall is down by so much. So that's basically what it is. Is the three million been spent? Is it been earmarked? And if not, can it go towards having a rent reduction? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have no one leader who seconded this. You have the opportunity to say something further if you wish. Well, I'm not going to keep repeating because we do keep repeating and sometimes certain people don't want to listen, but I'm led to believe that you you did get a response, Councillor Brealey. I'm, I'm sure that you've had a response now, whether you've Councilor, seen it. Councillor Mullinet, I have said I'll ask about that. Well, right, so I'll, I'm just confirming that. Mullinet, why are you, well, why are you saying really, that? You've spoken on this matter. You've, that's enough. I've shut Councillor Mullinet so up. I'm shutting you up. I'm certainly not uh, interfering with any conversations. I've not interrupted anybody. But what I would like to say, this, this is the report. It's the Treasury, Man Treasury Management Annual Review and Capital Programme. Uh, and uh, it was a great pleasure to second it, Mr. Moore. Thank you. Uh, I have had advice from uh, the chief executive who says, quote, I have responded on this matter. The council has not paid for security on the previous chief executive's property. I'm now going to ask Councillor Raymond, do you wish to sum up on this item, please? Yes, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor, since the Council set a balanced no-cuts budget in March of this year, its finances have suffered from the impact of the global pandemic and the subsequent lockdown to stop the spread of the disease. The pandemic has obviously had a major impact upon the economy and it will take some time to fully recover. However, there are some key indications of the problems and challenges to come. 
With the wheel of global economy halted, the government borrowing has hit the highest since the end of World War II. Unemployment has seen a sharp rise and is anticipated to continue to increase significantly. And the already struggling high street retail and manufacturing se sectors are showing further signs of collapse. The impact of COVID-19 on the cancelled finance so, is being uh, felt. Can I just interrupt you there, please? I've, asked, I've been asked for a point of order on Councillor Brele. Your point of order, Councillor Brele. Which council rules have been breached? Uh, the information been given by Ms. McKenzie. The the it was the information came from a police report that Donna Hall and what is, what is the breach in the point? Paid for Can you mute Councillor Brele, please? Why? A point of order is where you feel a, a breach of council rules and procedures on this meeting has take place. OK. Well, I'm asking a question and you keep... Could you mute, mute Councillor Brealey, please? That's not under discussion, Councillor Brealey. Councillor Raymond, can I ask you to continue, please? Sorry for the... Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Mayor. The impact of COVID-19 on the council's finance is being felt in two major ways increased costs and a fall in anticipated income. Our last month's return to government highlights a potential funding gap of £40 million. Council is facing an estimated shortfall of £5 million in council tax as we halted recovery action over the first three months of the year. The rise in unemployment has also forced more people to move on to universal credit with a re resultant increase in cancelled direct debits, rent arrears, and the number of cases applying for the council tax reduction scheme. Although the government's retail relief scheme and business grants provide valuable support to businesses, unfortunately they didn't reach all businesses and our estimated business rate shortfall stands at six million pounds for the full year. Since March this year, our income from car parks, market rents, planning fees and income from schools has fallen significantly and our commercial income has disappeared creating a deficit of about £7.2 million. The impact of the pandemic on the aviation industry has been widely reported in the media. Based upon the activity at Manchester Airport, our dividend and other income of £8.2 million is at a significant risk. We are experiencing increased demand for all our frontline services as we procure and provide support PPE to our frontline services and comply with social distancing measures as this has impacted on the planned delivery of savings in all our directorates, but particularly our children's services. Overall, the Council is facing an estimated budget gap of £25 million for the financial year of 21-22. The government launched a number of grants and funding streams to support local government and wider economy. The Council initially received £10.4 million and a further £9 million as part of COVID emergency fund, providing us with some relief towards the additional costs and loss of income. In March, Mr. Jenrick told us to do whatever it takes to help beat the virus. But five months later, the government has not delivered to local councils who have been at the front line in response to coronavirus and without additional support, the cuts will prove catastrophic. The government has confirmed that the local government financial settlement will again be for one year only. The business rates review will be delayed and the fair funding review will also be deferred. Let me be clear. On local government finance, this government is neither being accountable nor transparent. And it is worrying for local authorities in unpredictable economic atmosphere. The government's myopic policies and knee-jerk reactions on vital issues have made the situation even more complicated. There is the app that doesn't work. There is the face mask fiasco testing and care home scandal, and then there's track and trace. A lucrative contract worth £300 million being handed to Circle, despite the private giant failing on to find and isolate previously. Complete disregard of local public health leaders with local knowledge and expertise in favour of a centralised, invisible and unaccountable system. Council across the country Councils across the country need security and predictability, both financially and strategically. This pandemic has only exposed long-standing cracks in local authority funding systems and further cuts will be catastrophic. 
More than 70 councils are already considering issuing 114 notices. The county council network, which oversees authorities like Surrey, Buckinghamshire and Oxford County Council, has also warned that a second wave could bankrupt local authorities. Coming back to Wigan Council's financial and treasury management. Councillor Raymond, sorry to interrupt you again, but you have run out of time. And we have added the time on which we were stopped. <laughs> OK, I'm sorry about that. I will now put this matter to the vote. Oh, councillor, once I've asked the proposer to sum up, no other councillor can speak on this matter. And I know some councillors have asked, but you were too late. So I am now putting this report to the vote. Can all those against the approval of the report please show in the chat facility? I have two against so far. I will announce the result as that's been accepted. We now move on to item eight, questions and comments. Councillor Watson wishes to ask a question. Councillor Watson, can I ask you to speak now, please? Thank you, Mr Mayor. I'll just read out the question uh, first and foremost for anybody who's viewing this online. Due to the failed uh, bid for the Highway Infrastructure Forward Fund for the M6, M61 link road, are the council going to put on hold all developments that are dependent on this crucial bit of infrastructure? And if I may, uh, Mr Mayor, I'm just going to elaborate on that. Um, over the past decade or so, former industrial towns such as Averton has seen its population rapidly increase by 50% to a historic 20,000 and it's now pushing 30,000 with minimal in investment in, in its community infrastructure. Social habits have also changed with both parents now working for a living which will incorporate driving. Kids are staying at, at home longer yet again providing more cars at home for these family dynamics and then incorporate the additional use of work vans there's more cars on the roads, which also generates a lot of parking issues. Now, my main areas of concerns for this are the developments in the south of Hindley, Hindley Green, uh, which is the 3,781 development, and also in and around Aberton, which have 2,350 uh, planned developments. Now, without this link road, they're going to have to be dependent on the already stretched Wigan Averton Road. So my main concerns are that even though this bid wasn't successful, the deadweight approach, which is adopted by this council, will see a two thirds, um, two thirds proportion of the planned uh, development still going ahead. This will increase traffic, which then in, in, in itself will add journey times, added stress and anxiety to our residents. It will then implement and affect the clean air uh, within and affecting um, health. And then we incorporate the lack of investment in public transport as well, which is on decline. And then the additional uh, substantial lack of community investment in our schools, our uh, medical uh, GPs and dental practices, as well as the social um, our social infrastructures with our civic halls being uh, sold off, as well as the lack of investment in youth, we'll see a rapid rise in antisocial behaviour. So um, what I don't want to see is Wigan just becoming a concrete jungle. I like having our individual towns with um, with green spaces in between them. And this this makes us unique because nobody wants to see Wigan Borough just as Wigan Borough. We'd like the green spaces to have our individual towns. So, and I'm just going to finish with uh, how uh, Section 106 monies are being spent primarily on um, um, focus on affordable housing, which for me personally, I think is a very clever way in which the council are reinvesting community money with interest back into the council coffers. So, I personally think that 
without this link road, all planning should be re-evaluated and all the S section 106 monies should be then redeployed into and supporting our local communities. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And now I invite Councillor Paul Prescott to respond if he so wishes. Councillor Prescott, would you like to say something on this? Do we have Councillor Prescott? Paul Prescott? It looks like we've lost uh, Councillor Prescott. So I'll have to ask uh, Councillor Prescott to give you a written reply, Councillor Watson, for that one. I'd now like to ask Councillor Gerard to ask the following question. Councillor Gerard. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Chair. Just one second. I was waiting for the response of Councillor Prescott then. I've got yeah, one we've of the We've lost <laughs> Councillor Prescott. He's yeah. going to have to give a written, a written answer to that question. OK, I, I, I know Paul has given some kind of answer early on, but I'll, uh, I'll read out the question for the uh, viewing public. Uh, it's now been over 12 months since this council declared a climate emergency. What actions has the council taken since then to protect our local environment and to reduce emissions in our borough? And if I can, uh, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to elaborate. Now, across the country, I've been keeping a keen eye on this until uh, since uh, since we declared this emergency. And uh, uh, on, on the planning committee, in that time since declaring that, we've actually given up some greenbelt land as well on quite a few on, on quite a few issues, and only implementing the slightest minusculeest bits of, of carbon emission controls over new developments. So across the country, things have been going on, uh, which has basically left Wigan Council behind. Some of the things going across the country is retrofitting social housing to lift people out of fuel poverty by installing isolate, uh, insulated windows and walls, solar, solar roof panels uh, and an efficient heating system. Uh, at, uh, at the Perkin Ranch, which we've got quite a few of in the borough, uh, installing car, car parts with solar panels at Perkin Rides, uh, in, installing or introducing charters so we could have a, a Wigan Council charter to commit businesses to become carbon neutral and its employees. We could have solar power panels for schools and council buildings. We could also have a citizen's jury to get the, the public involved where we can actually, rather than keep debating about these and, and, and at planning uh, committees, uh, we keep we keep obviously to keep going around in circles. So the best people to ask are the actual public who, who this uh, involves. So I think bringing a, a citizen's jury uh, online with, with the council to speak to and get involved in their local uh, area, it can only be made up of, of about 20, 25 people from across the borough and use them. So I know Councillor Prescott's not here, but I'm just wondering if anybody else can, you know, answer some of these questions. Thank you very much. Well, it would be at this point where I invite Councillor Prescott to respond. Uh, but I have to apologise, he's not available though. We, we seem to have lost him, but although uh, Councillor Mullinex, the leader, would like to respond. So Councillor Mullinex, would you like to speak now on this? Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gerard, for your for your question. And, and I can certainly assure you uh, there's quite a lot and there's still a lot going on in terms of what we're doing, in terms of what we declared in the climate emergency. And there's a rather detailed and lengthy report, <clears throat> which I will certainly make sure that you uh, get get sight of. What I can also suggest is that, that keep your eye open for the government's white paper on planning, which certainly changes some of the points that you just made. Uh, and it's certainly worthwhile you're looking at them. And in terms of 106 money, that will disappear anyway. So what you need to do is be aware of that. Uh, there's a lot of changes coming coming your way and my way. And it may be something that you do want to take up with your own MP, uh, who is part of the political party that's introducing the new, new planning regulations. 
but I will certainly send you the copy of what we've been doing uh, in terms of the climate change since we last met. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for that. We should be having notices of motion, but there are no notices of motion this evening. So that is now the end of the meeting. Thank you. And that concludes the business for today. Thank you all.